We are now at the last section of today's lecture on soft equality constraints. And um, here we want to show why the solutions for the inequality constraints do not easily translate over into equality constraints. And we will get a, a first glimpse into, into equality constraints that will be the major topic of the, the next lecture. So why can't we combine inequality constraints to get an equality constraint? Um, let's say we had an, equal, an equality constraint um, x1 plus x2 must be equal to b. So this here, this looks like an affine constraint, so I'm forcing the, uh, the solution to be here somewhere on some, some straight line with some offset to, to zero. Yeah. So here this is an affine function, a linear function with some offset. Okay, and uh, the question is why can't I translate this um, by expressing it as two um, opposing inequality constraints? So here I could say I take x plus 2 greater or equal than b and x plus 2 smaller or equal to b. And um, from a mathematical point of view, the only solutions that are on the intersection of these two inequality constraints are exactly the equality constraint on the left hand side. Uh, the big problem is that if I take the interior of the intersection of the admissible sets, then it will have no interior. And, uh, and obviously for the interior point method, not having an interior is a problem. So think about this as the two logarithmic barriers coming closer and closer. So here I have the problem with the two logarithmic barriers leaving some admissible space in between. And now when I'm moving the two barrier functions um, in a way that I'm forcing an equality constraint, then at the end I will have them no longer intersecting and the logarithmic barriers will uh, blow up to infinity at all the points that I could consider for the equality constraint. And therefore, with the interior point method, it is not possible to just take opposing inequality constraints for one equality constraint. So what could we do instead? So now let's look at one uh, well, really trivial solution uh, that uh, is a heuristic and we have much better we have much better ways to solve equality constraint problems so now this is just a first glimpse probably you will hopefully will you will never have to use that in practice uh, but uh, soft constraints are one possibility to approximate heuristically the constraint optimization problem so soft constraints here mean that I have um, my function f of x and I constrain it to be h of x equal to zero. And um, what we might do is to state our preference for solutions where h of x is close to zero by penalizing or by adding a penalty term that is um, worsening all the results that are far away from uh, the solution set for the feasible solution set. And uh, here we are just adding a quadratic penalty. So now we just take h of x and we are squaring it. And um, for h of x equal to zero, this is fine. We are back to the original optimization problem. And for h of x not equal to zero, we are, have, we are adding this penalty factor. So we are rather looking for solutions closer to h of x being zero. And we can uh, weigh this by some factor alpha and this factor alpha is, is then a tuning parameter or a hyperparameter for our problem with which we can force um, uh, how close we want to, or by how much we want to enforce this uh, inequality constraint to hold. However, by doing that, we will introduce some bias. So with all probability, the, the solution will be not exactly on, uh, the, in the feasible solution set, but will only approximate it. And uh, we have to, or we might have to, uh, to let this alpha 
go to some really large number or have it go close more and more out to infinity in order to really constrain our optimization problem um, to be uh, the, this, this unconstrained optimization problem to, to be close to the solution for the constrained optimization problem. And um, uh, in general, whenever we, we choose some fi or some, some finite alpha, um, we, we will have introduced some bias to the optimization problem. Okay, what you should still notice here is the similarity between the soft constraints and the regularization that was uh, introduced at the end of lecture two. So regularization is a tool to prevent overfitting and well, just by looking at the formula, there's a, a strong uh, relation between the two. So uh, in, in the, for the regularization, we say that we would prefer our solutions, our model parameters to be closer to zero. And therefore we are suppressing some, some kinds of, of overfit. But here we are considering this for a constraint optimization problem. And now let's also do that with an example. You might recall from the first lecture the uh, way Carl Friedrich Gauss was approximating the elliptic orbit of the dwarf planet Ceres uh, hundreds of years back. And now we have a small example motivated by that. So we have a couple of points, some couple of observations and uh, we want to fit an ellipsis uh, or, or to find an ellipsis that best represents these points. And there are several possible options. So we could have an ellipsis that lies here somewhere like this, or the ellipsis could lie in here somewhere like this. And this is pretty much not, not entirely clear by, by looking at the points. And uh, the question is which ellipsis would be best. What Carl Friedrich Gauss did was Quite a bit different, so this is only only motivated by by this case, but um, uh, well, the the general idea still translates over. So um, due to gravity, we know that the planets are on an elliptic orbit around the sun, and we know that for the points p that are exactly on the orbit of an ellipse, there has to be a matrix A and a uh, vector b and some scalar c such that for all the points that we are looking at this overall expression is equal to zero. So uh, when we look at an ellipsis and we have a point that is exactly on the ellipsis or for all the points that are exactly on the ellipsis uh, for the matrix a vector b and scalar c that are describing the ellipsis we have this expression equal to zero. And uh, now let's simplify this and say we are only in the 2D case. And only in the 2D case, um, our matrix is, is a little easier. So we then only have a two by two matrix. And further, the matrix must be symmetric. So I know that two entries from my matrix must be identical. And so in general, I'm looking for six parameters that are describing my ellipses. So I have three parameters for my matrix. I have two for the vector and one for the scale. And uh, the question is, how can we fit these parameters to find the ellipses or the, the orbit that best describes the blue points that were drawn over here? Okay. Let's say we have a data set of observed points and the observed points are small p. And then we can write down a, a loss function and we can, uh, here we take the quadratic loss function once more. So when you look at this equation three here, um, what the loss function does, it uh, says for a particular matrix A, a particular vector B and, and scalar C, I'm computing this expression for the points I have observed and then the result probably will be different from zero. And now I'm penalizing the difference from zero. So here I have, quote unquote, I have unrolled the computation. So now here the, 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 the entries of my, uh, of my vector theta, I'm again, I'm looking for the best parameters for my model. 
And uh, the parameters theta here now contains the entries of the matrix, of the vector and the scalar. And I have unrolled the computation of equation 3. And then I get to a linear expression, uh, in this linear in the model parameters. Uh, so the expression is quadratic for, for the points, with respect to the points. But the expression is, uh, is linear with respect to the model parameters when I assume that the observations are fixed. Uh, and then if I unroll the matrix vector multiplication and so on, I get exactly to this expression. So I have P1 squared times A11 plus 2P1 times P2 uh, times uh, A12. So here the 2 is in there because the matrix is symmetric and one of the entries, the entry A12 occurs in two places and so on and so on. Yeah? And now I'm, I'm summing over all the points in my observations and uh, computing this, this expression here. And it is actually linear in the, uh, or this inner, this inner term is linear in the model parameters. And, uh, and then I'm squaring it because I take the, the, the squared uh, difference from zero as, as the loss function. Okay, so what we have to note here that there is a trivial solution. And the trivial solution is theta equal to the vector zero. For the, this solution, the expression um, that was taken from equation three is always exactly equal to zero. And uh, if we have then some quadratic optimization function, exactly zero is the best result that we can have. So here we have the problem that um, uh, we have our optimizer always has an incentive to converge to a trivial minimizer that does not explain us a lot about the structure of the matrix. So this is an informative result that we would like to avoid. Now there's an additional insight important here and the additional insight that is for a for perfect points that exactly lie on the orbit uh, we will have this uh, equation three here, evaluate to zero, exactly to zero for all the points P. Um, and um, since we know, and so this, this inner expression here, so what is here inside, inside the brackets, uh, this will be exactly zero uh, if my points P are perfect. That means that, um, um, and if I have perfectly selected uh, my parameters um, that are matching to my points P. And now, due to this linearity in the model parameters, if I'm multiplying this vector by two, then the overall expression would still be zero. And if I multiply it by any alpha, then the overall expression here, uh, before I'm squaring, would still be exactly zero. So somehow the solutions, so here the, the model parameters theta, they are invariant to some scaling, uh, or at least if, the, if, the, uh, if I was able to find the perfect uh, model parameters, then they would be invariant to some scaling. And now let's abuse that. So since we are here invariant to some scaling, we could also decide arbitrarily how, by how much we want to scale. And so what we do is we, we fix A11, and we say now that A11, we want that to be exactly one. And um, the rest of the parameters, they can vary however they want, they can fit around that. And now we are adding a soft constraint where we say, okay, the first model parameter, we want that to be exactly to one. And this then avoids the trivial solution where theta is exactly the zero vector. Uh, so and the other elements that will scale accordingly to minimize the overall error. But for now, because we can only express soft constraints, we don't have any hard, precise constraints uh, so far. We are just adding a, a penalty term for the soft constraints. So now here we are adding beta times um, a11 minus one squared. So this term here expresses our wish for a11 to be equal to one. And uh, we can scale this beta up uh, to, um, to, to get closer and closer to the solutions where, where this constraint here is true. 
or this constraint is, is holding to some precision. Okay, now we choose theta, beta very large and we choose beta uh, as uh, 10,000, so well, already quite large. And then when we solve the optimization problem with a Newton method or a gradient descent, we get a result, we are converging to a solution theta star, where for this entry of the matrix A11, we get pretty close to one, but not exactly. So here you see that with the soft constraints, we are approaching the, uh, the, the constraint, but we don't exactly get to it. And uh, therefore here we have introduced some bias, and this is exactly what I had mentioned earlier. But now we can look at the ellipse, and uh, this is the ellipse that is best fitting to the observed points. And well, if these were observations of a planet, then we would probably assume this to be the, the orbit. But of course, in the case of, of uh, Ceres, we had additional information because we know the position of the Sun and we know that the ellipsis has to be an orbit around the Sun. So there are additional constraints that can be considered. And back in the day, well, the mathematics, if you look into the detail, it's, it's intricate, but to some point also primitive compared to what we do today. Okay. In the next lecture, we will learn to get away from soft constraints and to consider hard equality constraints and ways to transform our optimization problem in a way that the equality constraints are upheld exactly and that we don't have to fiddle with some, um, with some penalty terms and maybe run into numerical issues because we have to increase our beta by, by a lot. Um, so uh, the next lecture will be entirely on inequality constraints, but for now this also concludes today. So to summarize what we saw today, we had the definition of open and closed sets, and uh, we saw also the definition of the interior of a set, which then later was important considering uh, possible solutions for inequality constraints. We saw the definition and the difference between constraint and unconstrained optimization problems with the two different types of constraints that exist, so inequality constraints and equality constraints. We saw a first method, uh, the interior point method, uh, that is solving problems with inequality constraints. We applied that to some examples, for example, uh, the optimal resource allocation problem. And uh, we found out, or we, we saw how the logarithmic barrier is constructed uh, to get to uh, something that can be solved as if it was an unconstrained problem. We saw how to find out an initial interior point uh, that obeys all the inequality constraints because we need an initial interior point that is admissible as a starting point for then our iterative solution methods. Uh, we uh, translated this to uh, the class of linear programming problems which was originally solved with the simplex method, but obviously the interior method there applies also. And the interior point method has the advantage that it can solve nonlinear optimization problems. And the linear programming problems are only uh, a small part of, uh, of uh, the overall class of optimization problems that we would like to solve. And we saw soft constraints as a primitive way or as a heuristic way to uh, approximate equality constraints because we cannot combine inequality constraints to get to an equality constraint. That's it for today. Uh, here are some of the references that were shown during the lecture. And uh, with that, I wish you a good week and uh, see you soon. Bye.